Joinks. Do you recall how we classify joints? We have three classifications, immovable, slightly movable, and freely movable. Also known as fused or fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. Let's begin looking at our freely movable synovial joints. Here we have our synovial joints, starting with the ball and socket joint. At our ball and socket joints, we have a great deal of movement available to us, and it's where movement can occur within three dimensions. The hinge joint is also classified by the movement available at the joint. So with hinge joints, you can only move within one plane. The joint actions usually available are flexion and extension. Examples are at the knee and elbow. A pivot joint is where movement is solely rotational. So an example of this is at our neck. The saddle joint is where you have two surfaces, a concave and a convex. And it's where the concave slides within the convex. Example of this can be found at the base of our thumb. The gliding or plane joint is where movement is usually across a flat surface. And with the condyloid joint, movement only occurs within two planes. An example of a condyloid joint is the articulation between the distal ends, so the far ends of the ulna and radius, meeting with the carpals, the wrist bones. Looking at the image shown, can you point out the ball and socket joints? Hopefully you thought about the joints within our hips and our shoulders. Can you point out a hinge joint? You can find a hinge joint within your elbow and knee. What about a pivot joint? A pivot joint can be found within the neck. Looking at a saddle joint now, you can find that within the thumb, the gliding plane synovial joint, an example of that, is the action between our collarbone and our scapula within our shoulder girdle. And lastly, ellipsoid joint example can be found within our wrist bones. Here we have the structure of a synovial or freely movable joint. So take a moment and identify the bones. On each bone end, you have articular cartilage. Within the inner lining of the joint capsule, you have a synovial membrane. Now when we begin exercising, the synovial membrane releases synovial fluid within the joint cavity. This allows for lubrication of our joints, which prevents us from injuring ourselves during exercise. Exercise is very beneficial for joints in the short term. It aids with synovial fluid release, which we just discussed. In the long term, it enables for stronger ligaments and tendons, which is the connective tissue that supports the joint. Also, due to the stronger ligaments in particular, we have more joint stability, which will prevent us from injuring our joints. We also tend to increase the range of movement at a joint, increasing our flexibility as a result of exercise. As we've stated before, you don't want to do strenuous activity with young people and they shouldn't be lifting heavy weights. Body weight is sufficient for this age group because the bones are still growing and they haven't fully formed yet. In pregnancy, we have the hormone relaxin to consider. This can affect the joint stability and their center of gravity would have also shifted due to the increasing size of their abdominum area. High impact and swift directional changes must be avoided when training someone who's pregnant. With age, you become more at risk to develop conditions such as osteoporosis due to decreased bone density. You also have a reduction in cartilage and synovial fluid release. You have less elastic ligaments and there can be other age-related diseases that present themselves with age. So weight-bearing activity is very important for this group. However, you want to focus on stabilization exercises and make sure not to do anything too strenuous. With disability, it's very specific to the type of disability. 